Well, good morning, saints. Welcome. Happy Sunday to you. Why don't you stand with us as we prepare to worship? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this day, Lord, for this opportunity we have to worship you, to uh, be together in fellowship, uh, to draw closer to you through the study of your word. Lord, we love you. We love all those gathered here this morning, all those who can't be here and who are traveling. Just pray that you would keep them safe, uh, give them time to, to worship and remind them of all that you have done for them as well as they are traveling. And Lord, we thank you again for uh, just this time that we have to be together. Thank you that uh, we have the freedom to gather still uh, in your name and to worship you through Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would be with us this morning, that would guide us, direct us, that we would uh, yield ourselves um, to him in all of his ways through worship and through fellowship. So go before us now again as we continue in worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Savior. Your day.
take day and night. Then like a tree firmly planted, I'll be grounded in your word. I will delight in the tree firmly planted I'll be grounded in your word blessed is the one who follows the way of the Lord blessed is the one I will happy and blessed we'll all be if we follow in your ways. Father, just remind us of those ways this morning. We thank you again that we can be here. Thank you for your son Jesus, as always, for his death, for his resurrection. Through him we may know you, that we may be reconciled to you, we may have eternal life that we don't deserve, but that you have granted through him. So Lord, we thank you again for this time. Pray that we would draw close to you as we open your word together. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Why don't y'all be seated? Well, I want to start by welcoming Pastor Brian back. Uh, where is he? Is he in here? <laughs> okay. Y'all, the uh, ba bad news, the rapture happened, and he's the only one. <laughs> no. Yeah. No, it's, it's great that he's back, and he's going to share a little bit this morning um, about uh, his experiences in Guatemala and his opportunities to teach there. Uh, and just uh, continue on in our ongoing missionary work there. So he'll, he'll share about that a little bit this morning uh, once he comes up. I uh, want to say thank you to all the parents and youth who came out to the zoo yesterday. That was a warm afternoon. Uh, first really warm afternoon it felt like of the year, but uh, it was fun being out, fun walking around, and, and just having that time together. Thank you to uh, Yvonne Cervantes for... Uh, spearheading that, and to Heath and to Rob for uh, leading the, the youth through that, and it was a fun time, and we'll look for more opportunities to do those in the future. Uh, upcoming events this week. Uh, this coming Saturday is going to be our next Musicians Fellowship 
It's at Christina Henninger's home in uh, Arrington, Tennessee. Uh, it's going to be at 10 a.m. They run from about 10 to noon or so. Um, so, of course, if all the musicians that you see up here, we tend to get together for that and fellowship and have food and time together, play some songs together. Uh, but any of you who would like to attend as well, if you're a musician and would like to just have an opportunity to meet us and to play and learn some songs and, and again, just fellowship together, you're welcome to attend. Uh, so please sign up through the uh, Planning Center app on the website if you'd like to attend that so we know how many would be coming. But that's going to be this coming Saturday at 10 a.m. Um, on the 27th, the following Saturday, is going to be our next men's breakfast. That's going to be at the Grecian Family Restaurant in Spring Hill at 8 a.m. For any of you gents who would like to join us for that, uh, please mark it on your calendar. Uh, and this is a... Uh, special announcement from the baggers, from Elizabeth in particular. On April 29th, there's going to be a prayer walk at the Pregnancy Center in Columbia. Uh, we're going to have more information on this, and email will be sent out. I just wanted to, to give you some basics of what that's going to be. So I think that's a Monday. And uh, they're going to meet at the Pregnancy Center and walk from 10 a.m. to 11.30. It's a drop-in, so anybody can attend if you would like to do so. And as part of our ongoing support of the pregnancy centers in Middle Tennessee, um, from the 21st, which will be next Sunday, through the week before Mother's Day, which will be May 5th, uh, we're going to be taking up collections uh, for new mothers and for infants for that ministry. There's going to be a box in the back of the foyer. Uh, we'll let you know which items you can bring, which ones will be uh, most useful for that. And again, you'll, you can look for an email. Just wanted to give you a heads up that we will be taking up that collection uh, starting next Sunday and running for a couple of weeks before Mother's Day. Uh, this particular, in terms of ministries this week, uh, the women's Bible study at the Hollins home is going to be canceled for uh, tomorrow. That's right, I believe, for Monday, yes. And it will resume the 22nd. Okay, good deal. So I just wanted to make sure you're all aware of that. Um, ongoing ministries uh, through the week will be, as per usual, midweek on Wednesday, uh, women's Bible study, men's study on Friday. Um, again, upcoming events, the River Run is going to be June 8th, 930. If you haven't signed up for that, just would encourage you to do so soon. Uh, so that you can reserve your canoe or kayak. Uh, more information, again, you can find on our website. You can sign up there as well. So hope uh, hope everybody can come out for that also. All right, with that said, why don't you all stand, say hello to those around you.
Well, good morning. Good to see you all this morning. I am still here. Believe me, if we, uh, if we all got raptured, I'd be pulling up the rear. You all would be ahead of me. So. Don't worry, that wasn't last call or anything. So, Hey, uh, thanks for uh, all of your prayers. Uh, they were appreciated and effective. It was a wonderful time in Guatemala, in Antigua. Um, the uh, church, Calvary Chapel of Antigua, has a Bible school connected with it. And uh, they have about a half a dozen students uh, each uh, semester and each year and all that kind of thing that go through a number of classes and all that kind of thing. And I had the privilege of doing an apologetics class there. And uh, it was just great. They were very engaged, lots and lots of great questions. It was just a really, really blessed time. Uh, I had a great chance to build some relationships with the students, and uh, they're ministry-minded. They want to take what they're learning, and they want to go. So it's pretty awesome. So you could pray for them, and uh, praise the Lord. If uh, uh, you have any questions about that, I'll be glad to share some of that. But I just really appreciate your prayers. Got home last night at about 10 o'clock, so I'm a little tired, but not too bad. And uh, so hopefully... Uh, you know, normally I'll put you guys to sleep if I fall asleep. Uh, at least you'll know why. So I uh, also wanted to just share uh, quickly, um, a lot of you have been watching the news, uh, and you know uh, uh, Israel has been, uh, uh, was attacked by Iran. Of course, there's the back and forth and all that kind of thing going on. And uh, we want to be paying attention to that. Uh, for those who may not be that familiar with uh, why it is that we support Israel, I just wanted to share a few thoughts on that. Um, when we support Israel, we're supporting them because they're God's covenant people. They're His chosen people. He has a purpose and a plan for them that He will be faithful to all the way to the end, up and including uh, their salvation and the installing of their kingdom. Uh, we're thankful to be part of that, but we're grafted in the vine as Gentiles. And so they are ultimately the ones that God will demonstrate His faithfulness on behalf of. And so uh, that's not to say we agree with everything they ever do or anything they ever say. They are in the land in unbelief right now, as a matter of fact. So we want to pray for not only the peace of Jerusalem, but for the salvation of the Jews as well. And so, but be paying attention. Right now, uh, as of last night, um, there's sort of a, uh, a bit of a calm, and it's hard to know whether that's the calm before a very turbulent storm or not. Uh, it's a very interesting thing to watch the back and forth. They want to escalate, but not too much. But at some point, things will completely cut loose. Uh, if, in fact, we uh, see an unfolding of uh, what is described in the Scripture in places like Ezekiel 38, uh, at some point that will involve seeing God very visibly come to bat for His people. And that will be a very dramatic time. Um, another thing that we want to pay attention to here is that uh, traditionally the United States, uh, by and large, in the, at least the modern era, has been a friend to Israel. That's rather... Uh, rather in word only at the moment. It's rather weak, but at the same time, it's always good to, at least in some level, be in support. But recognize, too, that um, if you are unfamiliar with Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, um, uh, there is mention of Tarshish and her young lions. Uh, it's in cha chapter 38, verse 13. And there is mention of this group of nations, including Saudi Arabia, and whoever Tarshish and her young lions are, uh, they're on the sidelines sort of condemning the uh, assault that the nations that come against Israel in that scenario are doing, but they don't seem to be getting involved. Um, there is a reasonably good uh, uh, line of thinking that if Tarshish is in fact speaking of Britain, then her young lions would include nations like the United States. So one has to ask if in fact we're in that scenario, but we're not getting involved helping our friends, our democratic partners in the Middle East, why wouldn't we be? Uh, it's, I, I'm, this is not going to be a whole prophecy brief thing, but it's just the, one of the reasons why we want to pay attention to what's going on is because if, in fact, that is a reference to the part that we are playing, not playing during that scenario, one again has to wonder why it is. Well, um, there's lots of theories as to how that might come about, but uh, Iran has made no secret of, of her threats toward us as well for standing with uh, Israel. Uh, so if for some reason something happened where um, we found ourselves undergoing terrorist attacks or some kind of thing, that might be enough for us to stay back 
uh, or maybe just the avoidance of any, in, uh, of any kind of involvement in that sort of conflict in itself might be enough for us to stay back. We don't know exactly how that's going to play out or even honestly for sure if that's even a reference to us. But we do want to pay attention and be aware. Uh, truly, the day is coming when these things will be fulfilled and God will make his name great. He will demonstrate once again his faithfulness to his covenant people. And uh, who knows, maybe before that happens, we might be out of here as, uh, as that happens. But we may not be. So be watching, be praying. Uh, Psalm 122, verse 6 says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem and may all who love her prosper. And so we always want to be on the right side of Genesis 12, verse 3, so 2 and 3 and such. So um, just wanted to share that. If you are unfamiliar with why the church tends to talk about some of those things, that's just a little bit of uh, insight on some of that. But I know many of you, of course, do pay a lot of attention to that sort of thing. So let me just encourage you to, um, to do that. So, all right, with that said, let's go ahead and stand. Let's read the Word of God together. I'll ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 26 uh, through... Uh, Oh, I just opened the wrong book. I'm looking at it, wondering where that chapter is. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. And read this with me out loud, if you would. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in His presence. But of Him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that is, as it is written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord." Father, we are so grateful that Jesus has, in fact, become these things for us. We thank you that we are among the redeemed, that we're those who will one day see you face to face and who, with the Holy Spirit living within us now, are being further and further sanctified, set apart to become more like Jesus. So we pray that you would continue that work here today, that through the teaching of your word, our fellowship together, our lifting of our voices and our hands, and, uh, and just coming into your presence, these would provide avenues for you to draw us close to yourself and that the Holy Spirit would also again work in making us more into the image of your dear Son. Father, we're very grateful for this time together. We're reminded of just a taste of what it will be one day when we're all around your throne, people from every tongue, tribe, and nation, worshiping and glorifying the Lamb. So be with us here today. We know you will be. We desire to meet with you, and we desire for you to have your way in and through us. So please have your way. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, you can stay in 1 Corinthians because we're going to begin the study through the Corinthian letters today, this morning. So um, uh, thank you very much to Michael and Justin for covering the teaching while I was away. They were so good and uh, just wonderful teachers of the Word. And um, I'm, I'm grateful that, uh, that we have them, and I'm grateful that you all love the Word of God. I'm grateful that you love to open your Bibles, and you like to study, and you like to know the God of the Word as, of course, you study the Word of God. So Praise the Lord for that. Today we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to just take the first few verses as we get going here. But 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, these opening verses don't quite spell out what the whole letter will cover, obviously, but let me just start by reminding you of something you've probably heard before. It's never a bad thing when the boat is in the water, but it's a very bad thing when the water starts getting in the boat. Uh, the letter to the Corinthians, or the letters to the Corinthians, is an extremely contemporary uh, view of the local church and its place in the world. And unfortunately, in the case of the Corinthians, the place of the world in that church. Uh, much like the water getting in the boat, Cor Corinth was a place that, uh, a church, a body of believers that had allowed the world to have tremendous influence and sway upon their thinking 
even to the point, believe it or not, where some had begun to doubt the importance or even the happening of the resurrection of Christ himself. And so the Corinthian letter is a very, very important one to us for a lot of reasons. And it's been a while since we've been in these letters, and I thought it appropriate after we'd gone through a study of the gospel in uh, Galatians, both what the gospel is and what it accomplishes in the lives of, uh, of, of, of followers of Christ, it seemed like a good idea. And frankly, praying about it, I felt rather compelled to spend time in these two letters uh, because it is a good view of what the church is supposed to be in the world and what the church would do well to avoid becoming in the midst of the world as the world is trying to creep inside. And frankly, because of the, fresh, of the flesh that we have, it is not a difficult thing for the enemy to find a foothold that eventually becomes a stronghold and water begins to get in the boat. If too much water gets in the boat, it begins to sink. People become in danger. It's not natural, it's not right that that should happen. And so a study of the Word of God, in particular, when we look at the things that the, word, the Lord has to say to the body there, uh, we're going to learn a lot of very important things that we want to take heed to as well. Uh, it's not going to be my intention to go off on, uh, on the church by and large because I find it not a good idea to go after another man's wife and make him say bad things about her. So there are believers here no doubt struggle with some of these things. There are genuine Christians who unfortunately still have a too much of a foot in the world and that kind of thing. Uh, and no doubt we'll speak about some of those things as we go. But my intention is not to cast aspersions on the body, but rather instead, to, to, for our own sake and for our own part, to simply take a look at what the Word of God has to say and take a good self-examination of our own hearts and see if we haven't allowed a little bit of the water to trickle into our own boats, as it were. So that being said, let's go ahead and begin to take a look at this letter. Uh, again, a little bit about... Um, uh, about Corinth. Corinth was a port city and a rather significant one. Um, it is mat a matter of fact, it, because it was a port city, it was a place where there was the influx of a lot of not only goods and services and such, but a lot of ideas and influences. Uh, ideas from other places, religious ideas, social ideas, philosophical ideas. Uh, Corinth was pretty much second only to Athens in terms of the uh, effect and influence of philosophy uh, uh, on the people of the city. Um, Paul visited uh, Corinth for about a year and a half, as we read in Acts chapter uh, 18. Uh, he spent 18 months planting the church, pouring into it, uh, investing himself in it, helping them to grow in their faith, be established in their faith, for the churches to be established there. Again, as we've mentioned in the past, it's not like there was a single church in Corinth that everybody just went to and attended, but rather the church at Corinth spoke to lots and lots of small bodies that had risen up within the city, uh, house churches essentially. We read about this in Acts chapter 2 where they met from house to house and they studied the apostles' doctrine, broke bread, uh, enjoyed fellowship, and prayed together. Uh, this was the model of the first century church. And so when Paul writes to the church of Corinth, that meant when this letter got to Corinth, it was shared among the house churches as they gathered the, gathered the small gatherings of the saints, or copies were made of it and then distributed amongst the different gatherings of bodies so that they could study what Paul had to say. They could all hear the word and see what uh, the Lord had given him. And so, um, interestingly, Corinth, uh, there's a legend uh, that is connected with Corinth about a king named Sisyphus. How many of you are familiar with the legend of Sisyphus? Some of you are. Uh, you may know Sisyphus by virtue of a picture of a man pushing a rock up a hill, and every time he would get to the top of the hill, it would roll all the way back down, and he would have to roll it back up again. That was Sisyphus's punishment in hell. He would push this uh, rock up a hill, but forever, it would roll back down, and you'd have to go through the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, and there's probably something of, a, uh, of an example of how Paul may have felt about his work among these believers, because you will find, and we'll discover as we make our way through this letter, that Paul wrote the letter in order to answer a number of questions that the church had raised since his visit. Paul would write this letter from Ephesus uh, when he was there for three years. And these, the letter was intended to, uh, uh, or they wrote him in order for him to answer a number of questions, which he eventually gets to starting in about chapter 7. The reason it takes him seven chapters to get to those questions is because the first six chapters are spent dealing with problems within the church that he's been made aware of. 
So you can imagine after spending a year and a half in that church, the longest among most of the churches, except for maybe Ephesus, but the longest time you spent with any single uh, body of believers and having left them a short while later, finding out that they're already falling into all kinds of worldliness or that a lot of worldliness still remained in the church even after their conversion to Christ. Now again, um, as we said often during the letter to the Galatians, Paul's intention is not to get legalistic with the Corinthians, but rather to invite them to recognize that as they are in Christ, as he would say in chapter 6, as we'll see, because they are in Christ, they are no longer what they once were. And that's true positionally from the moment of salvation. From the moment you come to faith in Christ, you are walking with Jesus, you now are His. That's a positional reality. There's no changing that, there's no losing that, there's no uh, having that snatched away from you, and you will not be snatched out of the Father's hand nor the hand of the Son. That's a positional reality. Practically, however, it is possible for us to, uh, to commit sin while we are believers and not to deal with that. To, in a positional uh, sense, uh, in reality, to be righteous before God because He now sees us through the finished work of Christ, but to still be living much like the world. Paul would tell this church that all things are lawful for me, but not all things build up, not all things edify. So it is possible to be a believer and to still continue to sin. But that is a cry and shame. That is an evidence of somebody not only that struggles against sin, they may not be struggling against that sin. They may be comfortable with it and just feel like they're done doing battle with it. We'll talk more about that as we make our way through the letter. But while it is possible to still live in a way that looks still far too much like the world, while truly, genuinely putting your faith in Christ, trusting in Him for your salvation, it ought not be so. And typically, it is indicative of a relationship with Christ that has diminished back, has fallen back, has drifted away from the love relationship that He has called us to live in and to walk in daily, and maybe it's become legalistic, or maybe we just have sort of moved past that honeymoon period and we're sort of comfortable where we are and not giving the Holy Spirit the place that He wants in our lives. Um, any of you who are married have probably heard the expression, the seven-year itch, right? How many of you have heard that? None of you have experienced it, I know, but you've probably heard of it. Read it in a book somewhere. But there's this theory, this idea that after a certain amount of time, a marriage becomes sort of rote and sort of uh, ordinary and plain and maybe even start getting on each other's nerves a little bit or something like that. For some of you, maybe it took seven minutes. For some of you, it's never happened. Who knows? But the point is this, is that when that begins to happen, if it begins to happen, the idea is not to get comfortable in that place but to scratch the itch, to do something to deal with it, to not allow it to persist, but rather to pour into that relationship so that it might be as full and beautiful and vibrant as it was designed to be. Marriage, as a, as a practical reality, a gift from God, is supposed to be sort of a little taste and a glimpse of heaven on earth, as the church is the bride of Christ. And this is the model that is built into this idea of marriage. And the expression that it's supposed to give the world is what this relationship we have with Jesus is really like. Well, when that relationship uh, with Christ begins to um, kind of fade and drift and just get ordinary and such, it begins to look a lot less like what it's supposed to look like and designed to look like, and we are experiencing it in a far lesser way than God would have us experience it. Well, the goal there is not to simply allow it to be that way, and certainly the Lord Himself is not wanting it to be that way. For his part, he is continuing to try and woo us closer and closer and more deeply into that relationship every day. Even in his correction, it's so that we might turn around and come back and walk with him all the more closely. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens, right? At no point does he ever begin to just let this relationship go as though it were unimportant to him. The problem is that sometimes it becomes less important to us. And I would suggest that this is what we'll see in the letter to the Corinthians. They are far more interested in being accepted by the world and being seen in a certain light than they are deepening their relationship with Christ and letting that old relationship go for the sake of the new. God help us not to fall into the same trap. In the flesh, it is possible for us to do that. But we can, as we hear these words, as we study this letter, these letters, 
uh, we can find ourselves being reminded of the beauty and the richness of what this relationship is supposed to be and the beautiful changes that happen in our lives as we cultivate it and give space to the Holy Spirit to work within us as he would desire to. So to start though, we're gonna look uh, not only at Corinth, but also a little bit about the letter and of course about Paul as we move into this. Um, the, um, uh, we mentioned uh, that the letter deals with a number of problems in the first six chapters and then Paul begins to answer some very specific questions. The letter itself was written in about 55 or so, times vary between 54 and 57 AD. Uh, Paul is uh, on, on one of his three missionary journeys. He is uh, pouring into, the, he had poured into this church back again for 18 months or so, and now he's writing to them as he's in Ephesus. Um, the, um, the letter is actually the second of three letters that Paul wrote to this church. We don't have the very first one, but in chapter 5, verse 9, Paul refers to an earlier writing to this church. We don't have that again. We only have what we call 1 Corinthians, which really is 2 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians would therefore be 3 Corinthians. Uh, but since we just have the two letters, we call them what we do. Um, now, in the first, uh, first verse of the first chapter, we see here once again, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Paul, as you may be aware, uh, was at one time known by a different name, the name Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, Saul was a Pharisee. He was somebody who was admired among Hebrews. He was obedient to the law zealously. Uh, he was someone who was very strict among the Pharisees and was quick to do the sacrifices, the offerings, the the uh, the uh, uh, the rituals and all of these things, he, if he sinned, he was on it. He was not casual about his relationship with God, and he was very, very much zealous for the law. Uh, a premier example of somebody who uh, sought to attain and, and, uh, and, and maintain a right relationship with God through his actions. He believed that one was made righteous by virtue of how well they kept the law. And when he failed, Again, he was very quick to deal with that. Uh, Saul, one day, was on his way to a city called Damascus, a city that, frankly, is in the news every now and again today. Um, but he was on his way to Damascus, and his intention was to haul Christians off to prison. He had letters, papers that gave him permission to do this. And en route to Damascus, the Lord actually appeared to him. A light shone from heaven. Uh, they were blinded by it. Paul literally was, was blinded for a period of time from it. And uh, the group he was with heard a sound, but he actually heard the voice of the Lord saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Well, who are you, Lord? Saul didn't realize that by persecuting followers of Jesus, he actually was uh, persecuting Jesus himself. Take note, that is how Jesus sees it when you go through the persecution from the world. He feels it personally. He takes it on his own chin. He said, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. You're fighting an uphill battle here, aren't you, son? Well, who are you? Jesus. What would you have me do? He goes to the house of Ananias. He's uh, prayed over by Ananias. But before he gets there, the Lord speaks to Ananias and says, hey, I'm going to send you somebody. I'm going to send you Saul. And Ananias was thinking the Lord had to have been kidding. He said, have you heard about this guy? He's persecuting your people. You're sending him here? He says, well, I've got, I've got a job for him among the Jews, the Gentiles, and even to stand before kings. Saul shows up, and I praise for him. Scales, something like scales fall from his eyes. He can see again, and thus begins what will become the rest of a lifetime completely sold out for the very same Jesus he was persecuting just days earlier. Saul would uh, become better known as Paul. We know him by that name far better. Um, he would go on to write about a third of the New Testament. He would plant churches all over the known world at that time, all over Asia Minor. He would take three missionary journeys. He would ultimately spend time in Jerusalem and then make his way to Rome where he would be ultimately martyred. Um, he is an example, second to none. Not only in the fact that he is someone who is uh, so prolific in his writing and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but in terms of even his own honesty about his own struggles in the flesh, as you would read about in places like Romans 7 and to Romans 8. 
Uh, he is not only a giant, but he is accessible. He is somebody that we can read and learn from and be brought to the deepest places of theological thinking and understanding, but at the same time recognize that he is a man with human frailties, went through human sufferings, went through uh, spiritual warfare, was persecuted, uh, and even dealt with his own struggles once again in the flesh, but walked with the Lord in such a way as to set an example. As a matter of fact, he would even say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Never claiming to be Christ or on par with Christ, that was never the intent in those words, but rather insofar as I can remind you of Jesus and show you what it means to walk as a follower, please take my example to heart. Now I'll tell you something, if you've ever been an example for somebody else as a believer, you know that that can carry some weight. Every time you mess up, and you will. You feel the burden of letting down somebody who is trying to walk with Jesus and looking to you as an example. But nonetheless, that's the call on all of us. Paul didn't say that just to pastors or evangelists or other uh, people that are sort of held on a pedestal. He said it to all of us. That's an example that we would all do well to follow. But this is the man who wrote this letter, and again, so many in the New Testament. And so we will see various elements of Paul's personality in it. Of course, his rich uh, theological approach, but we'll also see sarcasm. We'll see plain spokenness uh, that will help them to realize the areas that they need to work on. He will not beat around the bush. He will point out the problems that need to be addressed. And that kind of plain spokenness will be good for us. And so therefore, I will be plain spoken. But I'm not just talking to you. I'm talking to me. These are words for all of us to take in. Because at the end of the day, we all want to be more like Jesus. I want to ask for a show of hands because some of you may not hear me and everyone will look at you and say, why didn't you raise your hand when he said that? I'll just assume we all want to be like Jesus. And so therefore, we want to open the word and we want to hear what he has to say to us. We want to see what the Holy Spirit would have for us in this book. This is not just an academic exercise. None of these Sunday mornings are. These are all times for us to look at what the word of God has to say and say, Lord, if this is not me, make it me. So let's ask him to do that. Father, we would ask once again that you would have your way in us as we look at these words, that you would work in us that which you would desire to change, that you would reinforce the things that are right, but you would remove the things that are wrong, that you would address us and deal with us plainly and help us to see it and help us to be honest enough to acknowledge it, to confess it, to lay it before you and say, thank you that that was paid for, but help it to be no longer true in my life. Help us to remember what we once were but to recognize that we are no longer this positionally, help it also to be true practically. Father, at the end of the day, we want people to see Jesus in us. We want to be able to say, like Paul, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Help us to that end, Father. Again, we need your Holy Spirit for this, so we pray he would find the freedom in our hearts and minds to accomplish that. And it's in Jesus' name again that we ask. Amen. Um, Paul, again, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. Uh, an apostle is somebody who is sent with a mission. Uh, I know it's very in vogue right now uh, and actually a central part of some uh, uh, group's uh, theology that apostles are around today like they were in the first century. They're not. There's nobody in the fir- in the cent- around today that has the authority of a Paul or a Peter or of a Matthew uh, at all. We are all on equal footing. There is no one that speaks to the church universally on behalf of Jesus. There are no apostles in that category or class today. However, Paul was called by the will of God, as a matter of fact, commanded by the will of God, as First Timothy, as he writes to Timothy in First Timothy. He had a very particular calling, like the twelve, but his was uh, ultimately in in, uh, in a mission to the Gentiles. But not only to the Gentiles. Again, as it said in uh, Acts chapter nine, the Jews, Gentiles, and even before kings. But his call was to be uh, a mouthpiece for Christ Jesus, to be a teacher to the church universal. So this word to the Corinthians was on one hand to a local body of believers in Corinth, but we are still gleaning from it even today. But he is called an apostle. Again, the term simply means one spent with a mission or on a mission, with a message. In the most general sense of the term, again, no one is like Paul or the apostles in that category today with that kind of authority, but all of us are called to be on a mission with that message. Uh, In that very general sense, this word could apply in terms of that job description, but let's not confuse terms. Uh, That being said, he's called an apostle, and again, in his case, very specifically, an apostle, capital A, by the Word of God, 
by the will of God, I should say. In other words, it was God's purpose to have his hand upon Paul for this mission and ministry. Not to sort of uh, just say something that's almost cliche, but you should know that God has his hand on you for a purpose as well. Ultimately, it is gospel ministry, whatever that may look like, whether it is out sharing your faith in an evangelistic sense or living it out in your day-to-day life. In, in, ultimately, the Lord has his hand on your life and mine for the sake of the glory of God. So whether it's in your home or it's out there in the streets of the city or in the highways and byways, God has his hand on each one of us for the sake of his glory and for the sake of the world recognizing it and coming to worship him as well by way of the gospel. So he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. On the other side of that coin, whatever it is God has called you to, pursue that. Some of us don't know what that is right now. Some of us are wondering if the Lord has a call in our lives. He does. But what that will look like, we don't know. Some of us take a long time to figure out what it is that God has for us. But one day, all of a sudden, we wake up and realize we're in the midst of it. But whatever that is, be about that and be content with that. The Lord may change your calling one day into something else. But whatever He has you do, be content in doing that. Uh, I say that because there was a time when I sought very, very much to be an evangelist. Uh, I don't have that gift as far as like uh, some people can meet somebody on the street, make a cold call with the gospel, and this person's coming to Christ right there. I don't have that. But I I so admired that. At one time, I wanted that. And I would share my faith with people, and and they would hear it, and maybe, and then okay, and, and and sometimes you'd see someone want to want to know Jesus and all that. But most of the time, it just sort of went right by him. Uh, that wasn't my calling. It wasn't what I, what God really had put on uh, any special call in my life for that. Um, so don't don't look at someone else. To me, that was the pinnacle right there. But the pinnacle is whatever it is God's called you to. There is no job too big or too small. The call is whatever God's put on your life. I won't mention any of them because the natural tendency is to think, okay, well, that's down here somewhere. Maybe one day I'll get a better one. No. The call is whatever God has put on your life. Be faithful to it. If God wants to call you to something else, he will. There's a passage in, uh, 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 that we read about. It says, don't despise the days of small things. That doesn't mean that to God they're small things. We may see them as small things. Remember, if you were, as a matter of fact, if you were here for the, uh, the presentation that Jay McCarl did on Good Friday, what was the lowest job in the house? Foot washer. Not only did you not want that job, you didn't even want to be associated with the person who had that job. You didn't want someone to think that was you, like it was, eh. Jesus gets up, wraps himself with a towel, gets a basin of water, and begins to wash the disciples' feet. Jesus does not see any job that he calls you to as insignificant or small. Matter of fact, he tells us to reach for the floor, to be down there doing the lowest jobs. It is that that, that, that ultimately can honor and elevate Christ. An attitude that is willing to do whatever is one that honors the Lord. So, but Paul, in Paul's case, he was called to be an apostle. And Paul is very humble about that. He, in a couple of different places in the New Testament, would write about uh, this lofty place that he once held. Again, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, according to the strictest sect of his religion, a Pharisee, all these kinds of things. But he says, I count all these things as rubbish compared to the knowledge of Christ Jesus. He saw these things as part of his story, but he saw these things as actually keeping him from being in right relationship with God which is why he writes so prolifically about the gospel and makes sure that we understand that we are not saved by our works, but by grace through faith alone. If anybody could have earned it, it would have been him. God used the greatest example of legalism to give us the greatest teaching on grace. And so Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. And Sosthenes, our brother. That that doesn't mean by the will of Sosthenes. He's saying Sosthenes is with him. Uh, Sosthenes, along with Paul, sends his greeting. Now, who is Sosthenes? Well, in Acts chapter 18, Paul is in Corinth, and uh, the leader of the synagogue there, a man named Crispus, comes to faith. Well, this really ticks off the Jews in that area. Uh, and so they, they take Paul off to uh, a uh, leader in, uh, in Achaia named Gaius, who ultimately they bring their case before 
uh, Gaius or Gaius about uh, Paul being such a disturbance among the Jews. Because Paul's habit was to go to synagogues and preach Jesus there every time he came to town. When you read about him in, in the New Testament, every time on his missionary journeys he comes to a town, I think it's, if it's not every time, it's almost every single time. The next thing you see is that he went to the synagogue and began to uh, preach Christ to the Jews. Why? Because as he says in Romans 9, chapter 1, his burden for his countrymen according to the flesh, his kinsmen, is that they would know Jesus, that they would be saved, and I would be willing to forfeit my own salvation if it would guarantee theirs. Now, I don't know if you understand in plain language what that means, but that is quite a burden. I would be willing to go to hell on behalf of my countrymen, the Jews, if it meant their salvation. Look, I love you guys. <laughs> but I, I don't know that I could say that as honestly as Paul did. I might try and say it to impress you, but I think he really meant it. Um, wow, that is a burden. That is a burden. Um, and so every time he would come to town, he'd be looking for the local gathering of his countrymen, his kinsmen according to the flesh, and he would preach Jesus to them. He wanted them to be saved. Well, some of them got saved, including the leader of this one synagogue. So now he's causing a disturbance. So they lead him to this other area in Achaia where he's now brought before Gaius. And uh, they, they begin to break down all the stuff he's doing and he's violating our law and all this kind of thing. And Gaius says, guys, I, hey, hey, no, I don't even want to hear it. If this is your internal squabbling over matters of the law, you deal with it. And so he doesn't prosecute Paul at all. Well, there's a man named Sosthenes who runs the synagogue in Achaia. And apparently, Sosthenes was expected to either give a more full-throated uh, you know, endorsement of what they were saying, or, but for some reason, he didn't stack up to what they were expecting because the next thing you read is that they start beating on him uh, and then that's all you hear about him until here. If this is in fact the same Sosthenes that is spoken of in Achaia as the leader of that synagogue, it is entirely possible that that experience is part of what God used to lead him to Christ because now he's part of Paul's entourage. Powerful. Power of the gospel. Um, we don't often recognize how God can use even terribly adverse circumstances to accomplish his purposes and even lead someone to Christ. That's a bizarre thing to go through. I mean, here he is one minute getting beaten, and somehow along the way, he ultimately comes to faith. Again, we're presuming that's the same person, but it is very likely so. So Sosthenes, along with Paul, greets them. And he says, To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified or set apart in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all who in every place call on the name of, the, of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and and ours. There's a number of things in this passage. To the church at Corinth, which we've already, we've already spoken about it some. Again, this is a place that was heavily influenced by philosophies and worldviews from all over, the, all over the world, as people would come from these places and, 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 uh, and port there, and they would go out and do their business, or they would come here for whatever reason they were coming. They would bring their ideas and worldviews with them, and that had tremendous influence. As a matter of fact, when Paul is in Athens, uh, he, is, uh, uh, he, he goes to the place called the Areopagus, and they are debating all these different philosophical things because that's what they lived for. They were always looking for some new thing to hear and to consider. Well, that's what they were doing in Corinth as well, essentially. And so all these ideas were permeating. And the Corinthian church, once again, was being affected by this. This was affecting their thinking. Now, I'll just put this out here now, but it will no doubt come up many times along the way. The Word of God gives us our source of inspiration for understanding. It develops our worldview. It helps us to see the world through the eyes that Christ would have us see it through. It teaches us to, uh, while we are in the world, to not be of it, even as Jesus prayed in John 17. Um, the Word of God is that which has its impact and effect upon us. Remember, the Word of God does not return void, but it accomplishes the purpose for which God sends it forth. In some cases, it is to blind the eyes and to harden the hearts. But for those of us who know Him, it is always to convict and instruct and to train, to teach, to help us become more like the one who is the object of all of the Scripture. Jesus said in John 5.39 that the Scriptures speak of me. And so to know the scripture is to draw it closer and closer to the object, the person who lies at the very heart of all of it, Christ Jesus himself. Well, here in Corinth, uh, this is who Paul is writing to. The church uh, at Corinth, 
right? This church in Corinth, which is uh, uh, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Now, the church of God is exactly that. It is God's church. This might be Calvary Chapel Franklin, and every one of us at some point when we're talking about our church might call it our church. And that makes sense. Don't get me wrong. I'm not rebuking anybody for doing that. I say it too. But really, it's God's church, right? It belongs to the Lord. We're the body of Christ. He's the head. We're the body. We're the arms, the legs, the eyes, the nose, all these kinds of things. But he's the head. And so it's his church, which means he gets to speak to it and point out what needs to be addressed or what needs to be commended. As a matter of fact, we have an extremely vivid picture of this in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. For all that the book of Revelation contains, for the body of Christ, chapters 2 and 3 are probably the most important thing, or at least up there among the most important things, where Jesus himself, who moves amidst the candlesticks in that, in other words, the churches, he sends these letters to the angels of these churches. The word angel just means messenger. So in that context, he's probably dictating letters to the pastors of those local fellowships in Asia Minor because that's who it was written to first. Literal churches in Asia Minor whom Jesus was writing letters to. Seven epistles to seven churches written or spoken to, dictated by the Lord himself. Now that's like, wow, really? You know what? This letter's to the church from the Lord. I mean, ultimately, it is the Lord's church, and this is the word he has for us. So this is the church of God. We are called by his name. Whatever name is on the door, whether it be Calvary Chapel or local fellowship of Fritters, Alabama, or whatever it might be, it is his church. If there's anyone here from Fritters, Alabama, I just made that up. I don't know if that's a thing. <laughs> but, but it's the church of God in Christ Jesus. Though, why? Because it's to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. The word sanctified and the same word saints that is used later both come from the same root, hagias, the idea of being separated to God. Um, to those who are being sanctified, on the one hand, as we mentioned earlier, we are positionally speaking already set apart to God. We're His. We are believers. We're children of God by faith, uh, by God's grace through faith. So we are positionally His. However, as Paul would write to uh, the Thessalonians, this is the will of God for you, your sanctification. And he mentions a few very practical examples of what that means, but it basically means that God is working in us to work things out of us that we be less connected to this world and more connected to Christ. So in other words, we are continually being washed and sanctified and cleansed and pulled away, really is what the idea of the word is, is that we are being set apart practically. This is where confusion often comes in for people and why we spend so much time in Galatians clarifying and driving home the idea of what the gospel is and what the gospel isn't. The gospel isn't our works contributing to the merits of Christ and we're becoming more and more saved. No, we're saved the moment that the grace of God is applied to us by faith. When we are justified, we are now His. Positionally, that's done. However, practically, if every now and then you just take a look at your life, every now and then there might be little indicators of things that He might still want to work on. Uh, so for some of us, it's a laundry list. But, you know, He's working on stuff to kind of pull us away from the world. Why? Because those things that are still part of us that are of the world are like, again, little footholds that become strongholds. So there are the two elements of sanctification, the being set apart completely by faith, by God's grace, you are saved. But then there's the daily reality of being further and further washed and made more like Christ, the idea of being pulled further and further away and pulled closer and closer to. To those who are being sanctified in Christ, who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Again, same root word, called to be those who are called apart. Now, I come from a tradition that saints were a different class of people, right? They were special. They were different. They were above. They were somebody that was like unattainable. Uh, there was even criteria where it's like, okay, not only is the lifestyle but this, but maybe there were even miracles ascribed to you. It was, there was a, a class of saint that is just like, wow, these are people to be uh, revered and venerated and such. Paul calls you and I saints. Are you and I special? I don't have any miracles to my credit. You know, it's like that, that seems like 
this, this speaks of somebody different. No, actually it doesn't. You and I are saints by virtue of the fact that we have been positionally set apart to God. In other words, we're no longer of the world, we're now His. Now, Paul lays this out at the very beginning. Sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. Because this church, as it will turn out, very clearly did not give that impression to the world around them. Not only were they... There was sin in the camp here that is not even spoken of among the Gentiles, Paul would say. And, uh, but on the other side of the coin, they had the gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation, so much so that they're actually abusing them. So they were this very visible dichotomy. They belonged to the Lord, but they didn't look like it very much. And so Paul is reminding them, and again, in chapter 6, he'll, he'll very clearly say, he'll list a whole bunch of things, adulterers, liars, all this kind of stuff, such were some of you. Now, fascinating, uh, by way of comparison, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 15, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. If you are familiar with the book of Revelation, is chapter 11 toward the end after all the judgments and all that kind of stuff? No, there's still a bunch of stuff yet to come. It's about the middle of the book. But from God's perspective, it's a done deal, right? Like, yeah, this is, this is what's true from God's perspective. Interesting comparison. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when he lists all these things that they once were, a lot of them still were that, practically. But from God's perspective, they are his now. It's just a matter of them catching up to their actual position. And it needs to be addressed. God's desire is that they not only be changed for their own sake, that they become more like Christ and that the obstacles to becoming more like Christ and even uh, knowing Christ better and better and better, removing those obstacles, but also because their testimony would have meaning and have power in the midst of the communities that they were in because it was a very, very worldly community that they were in. And they were to be light and salt and such. So sanctification is an important thing, both positionally, if you are a believer, you are positionally set apart already, but it is important for us daily to let the Holy Spirit have the work, uh, the space to do the work he wants to do in our lives. We're called to surrender, to submit, to give him that freedom. When we find ourselves confronting temptations, or if we find ourselves in a place where we are walking in sin, to come to the Lord. Lord, I am so, you know, you know that's paid for, right? It's done. That sin, Christ took it to the cross already. That shouldn't make us feel like it's okay to continue in it because it's all, you know, what does Paul say in, in Romans 6? You know, should we sin the more that grace may abound the more? I know we've said it before, but just to reiterate, d does it mean that we should, since we're under grace, just really sin it on up so we can show God's grace off a lot? Like, oh man, yeah, adultery? Yeah, but you know, God's grace is covering this. Look how big God's grace is. That's not the picture. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. And Paul says, God forbid. Should we sin the more that grace may abound the more? God forbid. Cor the Corinthians needed to learn that. They needed to be shown that and told that. And maybe we do too in some areas of our lives. So we want to give the Holy Spirit the, the room that he wants to be able to do that. Again, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, uh, uh, both, uh, both uh, theirs and ours. In other words, the Lord is theirs and ours to all who belong to Jesus. It's easy for me to talk about this. I just came from another country. I just got home last night. But it is good to know that we are not alone in our relationship with God. There are, in fact, uh, believers, saints all around the world who share this like precious faith with you and I. Um, in heaven one day, there is celebrating around the throne and worship with people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. God is not without a witness. So you and I, brothers and sisters everywhere, we're part of something bigger than ourselves. It's not just Calvary Chapel Franklin or Calvary Chapel by itself. It's, it's believers from every stripe, every background and such that are part of the body of Christ. Um, we worship Jesus together, those of us who are worshiping him in spirit and truth. You remember John Ford? He's looking for those who will worship him in spirit and truth. All of those who do are brothers and sisters to us. We're part of a family, part of a body, and he is greeting us 
uh, who share this like, he's greeting the Corinthians, I should say, um, um, uh, who share this beauty, who are sanctified in Christ Jesus along with all of those uh, who call in the name of the Lord. And then verse three, of course, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. Grace in Paul's writing in these greetings always precedes peace because that's the logical direction this goes. Um, you and I can't experience peace with God or even the peace of God until we've experienced the grace of God. It's God's grace that brings us to the place of having peace with Him. Again, we've talked a lot about this positional uh, thing. Um, but even the peace of God is based upon the grace of God. I'm troubled, I'm in turmoil because I'm wrestling against sin. God's grace is there to give you His peace. Child, your sins have been paid for. Let me have space in your life to work on this, would say the Holy Spirit. Um, not me, but the Holy Spirit. The peace of God in the midst of uh, trials. We can come to the Lord as our loving Father, right? Why? Because of His grace. Peace with God and the peace of God come as a result of the grace of God. And this grace of peace is, of course, given uh, by our Father in heaven, who again is our Father in heaven, even as Jesus taught us to pray. Remember that the mindset of believers in the Old Covenant was of Almighty God and this sense of His awesomeness and His power, you know, the lightning on Mount Sinai, all this kind of thing. In the New Testament, Jesus doesn't diminish that, but He adds something to it. You can know God as Father too, our Father in heaven. Wow. Uh, Paul would speak about the idea of being adopted as sons, where when we cry out, Abba, Father, again, a very tender kind of a term. Uh, we're invited to come before the throne of grace to obtain mercy in our time of need. Je uh, Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. This idea of thinking of God in such tender terms. The Father, of course, um, uh, uh, and then, of course, Jesus Christ, is, uh, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and, peace and, grace and peace from both. There's a sense of equivalency there in Paul's mind as he invites us to come and experience these things as, as he greets them. Now, as the rest of the letter goes on, we'll begin to look more specifically into the things that Paul has written them to address. And so um, buckle up, uh, get ready, because uh, there's going to be a lot of things for us to consider here. Um, I've, I've kind of considered uh, as sort of a working title, I don't know if it's up there, maybe it's been up there, I don't know, but I've, as a working title for these studies through First and Second Corinthians, and in particular First Corinthians, the idea of the church in the world and the world in the church. We want to be thoughtful about these ideas that Paul expresses, lest we again let water in the boat. So God help us. We're going to partake of communion here in just a moment now, so I'm going to pray and invite the worship team to come on up. And as we do, I'll invite you to uh, invite the ushers to come up and pass out the communion plates. They will bring it to the middle aisle, pass it to the end, and then pass it back, and they will then give it to the next aisle. And um, as we are uh, taking our communion, oh, just so I don't forget again, the communion bread is on the bottom. You can peel the thing off. Don't peel the top and then turn it over because you just discovered it. Bread's on the bottom. The juice is on the top. So keep your clothes clean today. So, um, but as we partake in this time, this is a, again a very special time as we consider what God has done on our behalf in Christ. When Jesus came into the world, he obviously taught profound things that were unlike anyone else. He did miracles that were beyond our, beyond wonder, speaking to the weather, raising the dead, feeding thousands with morsels of food. But ultimately, he came to pay our debt, to make a great exchange. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that he who knew no sin became sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Again, this is that positional thing we're talking about, the idea that Jesus came and took the, the filthiness of all of our sin, that which separated us from God, the worst of everything that you and I and anyone on the earth has ever committed, and he took it upon his shoulders to the cross, and he bore that for us. And in exchange, he gave us his righteousness. No longer does the Father look at us through our sin, but rather as Christ is our advocate before the Father, he now sees us through that finished work. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life.
This truth was demonstrated by virtue of the cross. When Jesus came into the world, died on the cross, was buried and rose again, all as the scriptures foretold. And now we look to him, the one who was pierced on our behalf, and we recognize that our debt has now been paid. We are free. This is a time that is often very somber, and rightly so, because we consider the weight of our sin that Jesus had to take. But there's also, uh, this is also the source of our great joy, because no greater expression of love has ever been given. For while we are yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So as we worship, I'll invite you to take the, uh, the communion and the, the, the bread and the cup. And we'll partake together as we're singing, so hold on to that once, uh, once you get that, if the ushers would come forward. Father, we want to thank you for the grace that you've shown us, that we remember and we even celebrate here in this moment. As we partake of the bread and of the cup, help us to recognize on the one hand the tremendous weight, the burden, the, the horrifying nature of what Jesus had to take upon himself in order to set us free. But set us free, he did. And so we bless you and we praise you and we worship you as we partake in these few moments together and remember, in Jesus' name, amen. This is my body. gather with his disciples that night. He was going to be betrayed, and he would take bread, and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. So as we take this bread, we remember how Jesus was willing to allow his body to be broken on our behalf. And so, Father, we thank you for the grace, the goodness that you've shown. And as we partake of the bread here now, we want to remember, as Jesus invited us to, his sacrifice on our behalf. Let's take the bread. This is the bread of life broken for you. This is the cup that holds the wine of the new. supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks and praise. And so this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. It's for the remission of the sins of many. And so as we partake of the cup, we remember the shed blood of Christ that washed us clean. Let's partake together.
take a long look inside and tell me what you see. He said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. This is my body given for you. This is the cup that holds the blood of a new covenant. This is forgiveness, simple and true. And this is the way that I have made for you. This is the way that I have made for you. Again, we thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you that Jesus was willing to come and to take our sin upon himself and to wash us clean. So we just pray that, Father, you would remind us regularly of your great love for us and the grace that you've given us. Father, we praise you, we bless you, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Why don't we go ahead and stand and let's sing together as we close. Let's celebrate and sing Blessed Assurance.
praise the Lord, may that in fact be what we're all about and let everybody see it. Amen. God is so good to us. Praise the Lord. Will the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace forever. Amen. Amen. If you need prayer or anything, please come on up. We'll be glad to pray with you. The rest of you have a blessed week in the Lord. God bless you.